Hey guys, I put a new set of stairs on the front of my house this weekend. I had to replace a hundred year old toilet. Oh, and, and listen, I got my roof replaced and that's how I met this week's guest. Always be asking people if they got compromised. It's almost ABC. I met a young guy who got scammed. He said, boy, have I got a story for you. And when I heard it, it was like, it was very sad, especially to somebody who is a young entrepreneurial guy who all of a sudden, as his business is starting to take off, somebody hits him with a scam. With that, welcome to What the Hack, a show about hackers, scammers, and the people they go after. I'm Adam, cyber get to the bottom of whatever the story is guy. I'm Bo, cyber. I died waiting for Adam to come up with the cyber whatever he is this week. And I'm Travis, cyber dingo eating baby. Wow. Yeah. Today on the show, we find out what happens when a young entrepreneur answers a call from an unknown number. Hey, Jordan, where are you coming from today? I'm coming in from uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And what do you do down there in Nashville? I actually uh, work for a pretty big time restoration company. We do uh, full on builds of uh, re-roofs through hail and wind damage. And then we do uh, interior restoration and renovation to inside of homes through insurance. So that's kind of the gist of what we do and kind of how we go about what we do. Gotcha. So Jordan, how old are you? I am 23 turning 24 this month. Well, I got to tell you, I've met you and you had a story about something that happened to you when you were younger. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. At 17, 18 years old, I was very involved with uh, drop shipping, uh, which is, if you don't know, selling products um, on a website all the way around the United States of America and outside and going into other countries. Um, and pretty much what it is is that you don't have inventory of any of your products. It's a way to start as a young entrepreneur. You don't have a lot of capital. You don't have a lot of overhead. You really just kind of build this platform of that website. And the only overhead that you have is using um, capital and and money to be able to expose yourself through social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram. And the way to do that is to spend, you know, a good bit of money on ads. Um, and so that was pretty much the only overhead I had was what allowed me to do what I did and uh, create the success that I did. What were you selling? Um, on this particular store, I had a little bit of arrangement of everything. It was kind of a holiday season uh, niche where I was selling different products. Just a general store. This one sold a lot of different items that were trending at that point in time during that season and that year. Can you give an example of one of the the niche items that you were selling? Yeah. So one of them in particular that we did real well with was um, AirPods. Apple had released uh, their AirPods, their first ones. A lot of people were buying them. It was the you know holiday season. And so obviously there's a lot of spinoffs, a lot of knockoffs of those products. And uh, I'd found a, a supplier um, that was selling a pretty good product, I thought. And um, that was the that was that was our main hit was selling uh, knockoff AirPods from Apple and and selling a uh, a, a product that was very similar. Um, we didn't market it or sell it as if it was an AirPod. We 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 made it you know very very noticeable that this product is not from Apple. Okay, so from what you've said, you made it clear that these electronics weren't really uh, counterfeit as such, and so we know that you're not the scammer. But what's the issue that brought you to our show today? It was just a day I'd been running the store, and uh, you know. Sales are coming through, spending money on ads, shipping the products out, kind of doing our thing. And uh, had ramped up. This store had scaled up, took up $100,000 in sales real early on. And um, I had received a phone call. And this phone call was very, very, very firm, very, very, uh, I'll never forget it. It was, it was, it was very eye-opening. The guy was... He knew all about me. He knew all about the business. He knew all about me, my personal information. He knew where the bank accounts were set up. And for a 17, 18 year old, I kind of, you know, was real, 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 real starstruck by this. I was listening. I was nervous. I was stressed. And they had said that a product that I had sold, um, which was one of these, you know, electronic devices that was an AirPod, had actually kind of, I guess, experienced bloated or kind of had a malfunction where it, you know, started to spark and they had made it seem as if it had hurt someone that had purchased this product. And so as a young gentleman, I was, I was very timid. I was very scared. And they said, so what do I do? What are the next steps? And uh, why are you calling? What they were saying is, Hey, look, we've already worked this out. We're, we're in communication with the person that had, had ordered this product. And, uh, 
we will receive $5,000 to settle. Um, we won't have any issues. We'll take care of this. The client will go ahead. The customer will be good to go from here on. And that's just kind of where we were at. So the, the kind of things that they knew about you, obviously they said there was an issue with the product, but what else did they know? They knew where I lived. Um, they knew how long I'd owned the business. They knew the business's name. They knew the products that I was selling. They knew where this product sold to, and they knew customer's name of someone that had actually ordered a product from me. You said you were starstruck, or were you just kind of uh, freaked out that they knew so much? What, what, yeah. what was it? Yeah, I was pretty freaked out. I mean, the fact okay. that they knew I banked at Bank of America, they knew you know, that I held a business account there. Um, they, they had a good bit of information. Uh, when you set up your website, did you uh, register your domain name with a privacy policy or did you just uh, register? It? Did not. Did not know better. Uh, did not take those actions. Yeah, sure. So with a domain name registration, that will typically give you the name, phone number, home address, and a lot of other information about the person who uh, registered that domain name in the first place, unless you pay a little bit of a fee on top of that uh, to keep that private. Yeah, I, I didn't know at the time about this. So, Adam, do you think that this problem Jordan was experiencing of somebody really knowing a lot about him uh, came via the domain or maybe elsewhere? It, it, it maybe a little bit came by way of the domain, but it sounds to me like the majority of the information came from somebody who either knew Jordan, knew the buyer, or knew both. Huh. Who could that be? Jordan, do you have any ideas? I do not. Hmm. What about your pick, pack, and ship? place could have could have could have been them um and in the situation of like i had said it kind of just threw me for such a curve and they had asked these questions and i was trying to just completely get out of this so i was just like you know look i'm gonna go ahead and pay this five thousand dollars and i i went for it i was young um and, and so i didn't really take the time to really dive into exactly how they would have you know come come about this and, and gone about the situation for me it was more so after the fact hey i had given them this i'd given them the routing numbers the account numbers and i gave them my social so at this point in time i'm more worried about that than how they figured it out So, first of all, you got a phone call. D did your caller ID indicate where that phone call was coming from or was just a number? It was a random number, obviously, but it said that it was coming from Texas. All right, so it was Texas call, but it didn't say, and and some folks are really good at, sp at spoofing phone numbers, so when the, the number rings, it would say either Internal Revenue Service, Federal Trade Commission. They can come up with all this kind of stuff. But it sounds to me like it's just a number so they knew all this stuff about you how did they how did they ask you what what did they say they came on the phone and it was just a simple hey look we're here working with a customer that had ordered a product from your website it malfunctioned this hurt them this product that you know we could take this further but we'll settle for five thousand dollars and nothing will happen past this uh, and that's kind of where it had come from usually when somebody calls you and they're threatening or they come up with something terrifying, which in this case, it was terrifying. You were worried that you might get sued by a customer or worse. Um, you know, you, it was like, it was, I'm panicked. I want to, I want to make this thing go away. Were they threatening at all? Or did they just approach you and say, Hey, listen, there's a problem. We have a solution. It wasn't super threatening. Um, it was just kind of, hey, look, this is how you need to go about this. This is how we can go about it. If you can go ahead and give us your routing number, your you know your account number, routing number, and you can go ahead and give us your social, we'll go ahead and process this payment. We already you know can go ahead and get this taken care of. We'll have no further communication after this, no problems. Um, and so I'm sitting here thinking, okay, I don't have to get an attorney. I don't have to deal with this. I'm not you know if this is all said and done right here for five thousand dollars. Don't call me again. I'm done here. So did they just ask you for your social security number or did they somehow trick you into giving that information to them? I think what had pushed me to give it to them was they, they had already had my last four. That, uh, that old trick. That'll yeah, do we, it. We, we, mm -hmm. Yeah, here's these four numbers. If you'll finish your social, we'll be able to process this payment out. I mean, they, they had already known where I banked. They had the last four of my social. They, I mean, they, they had done their work. And Jordan, you know, you can pull the same scam. I'll show you how. And this is not so you can go do it to someone else, but 
If you have pulled someone's credit card bill out of their mailbox, mm-hmm. you can then call them up and say, hey, I'm just calling about your visa card. It ends in uh, yep. 0001. <laughs> um, but I need to confirm the rest of the number. Can you do that for me? And what's the CVV on the back? Great. Mm-hmm. Okay. Expiration date? No, we're talking about the same card. I don't know what happened. Have a good day. Yeah. You know what happened is you just got scammed. So they're moving fast. He was not threatening you. You didn't even get the sense like they were like, oh, well, you know, you sold us these these uh, not Apple, Apple-like Apple products and they exploded. You didn't feel like there was a lawsuit on the other end of that? No, because I never, I never pretty much, I never marketed them as if they were Apple. I never, you know, everything was that this is just a, you know, a, a headphone. You know, this is just a, a headphone that you order online, just a dumb brand, it's a beast. This has nothing to do with Apple. Um, I think I was just more confused and conflicted by the situation, you know, that yeah, I'm not yeah. thinking about $5,000. I'm more so yeah. thinking about, whoa, you know, someone's eardrum could be, you know, completely messed up. I have legal actions. I'm going to be sued. I wasn't even worried about the $5,000. You know, I'm like, here's the $5,000. It's like, you know, it's not like I, in that situation, can reach out to friends and family and my parents. I was on the phone. You know, they, they told me that this needed, you know, I wasn't super pressured, but at the same time, it was like, hey, look, this needs to be done. Hmm. Well, scammers are great with uh, applying very subtle pressure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And so, I mean, at the end of the day, I've had multiple different situations where I've had, you know, fake IRS calls me and, you know, they have the part of my information. And, uh, you know, obviously now that I'm more alert, um, I'm immediately just boom, hang up, not a part of it. Um, I've also been a part of situations where locally here in Nashville at 22 years old, a year ago, I got a phone call from my whole entire family one day. They called me up. They're like, hey, did you drink last night? Did you go out? Did you get in a car accident? Like, what are y'all talking about? My grandma, who lives here, had received, she's 90 years old, had received a phone call that had said that Jordan um, had ran a red light last night, had a glass of wine, hit a car, and killed someone. um, Oh, no, Or or had severely injured someone. Mm -hmm. Um, And so here's his name. Here's his information. He's in the hospital. We're here with him. And, you know, if you can go ahead and send over, I forgot the dollar amount, but it was a good hefty amount of money. Then, hey, this will go ahead and allow Jordan to get out. And my grandma, who's 90 years old, she was freaking out. She, you know, she knows that I moved here. I did live here. You know, I'm young. Maybe I did have a glass of wine and, you know, you know, maybe I did hit someone. She's freaking out. Um, and at the end of the day, none of that had happened. And she's calling everyone in my family because she's about to give it. She's about to send the money. And... Um, you know, it was it was a complete scam. That's the grandparent scam. It sure is. That's a that's a yep. known that's a known one. We had that in my family too. And the key thing when somebody gets a call like that is don't panic and call or text or communicate with someone else in the family to find out if they've heard anything. Yeah, it was crazy. They had a recording of a young gentleman's voice um that actually was supposed to interpret my voice to my grandma obviously you know you know and they're she's like that's not my grandson and they're saying well you know he's here in the hospital he's impaired you know it doesn't sound like jordan but this is jordan this is your grandson and they have a young guy speaking so it's just kind of crazy how they put it all together well no they they and and in scams like this what they do is they they use kind of a scratchy line they have someone that'll say grandma and if if it's if it sounds like a, a guy or a girl the, the grandmother tends to blurt out the name and then they go with it. But in this case, they yep. apparently knew your name. Yeah. So, okay, let's go back to the 5000 So yeah. y- you paid the five grand, right? I did. <laughs> when did you finally figure out that you were scammed? I knew as soon as I had hung up that phone and gotten off that call and called my dad that it was, you know, I immediately, my dad knew and. Ten seconds for me telling the situation, you know, that you got scammed. I mean, this is complete a scam. We need to take you to the state. We need to go in there and see if we can't get your, you know, social security number changed. We need to put a credit freeze on everything, even though you're young. We need to go ahead and put, you know, freeze through Equifax, TransUnion, all of them. Go ahead and, you know, let's go ahead and get this sealed up. Through the process, found out that getting another social security number is slim to none. That doesn't happen, really. And so oh, they didn't give me that. We went, we tried. And so from here on, I just got to be really highly alert to everything. I'm staying on top of everything. Obviously, you know, I've been through this. So anyone that calls me, it's, it's just a hang up, you know, at this point. But my question to y'all actually would be, you know, in these situations, when you get a call like this, what what would you recommend doing you know is there anything that is there any situations or times where these gentlemen get caught or is it just simply best to just hang up bo who you're talking to 
is a guy who loves to scam the scammers. Well, what I, I like to do is get them right to the point where I lead them down a primrose path of successfully scamming me until whatever it is that they're after, because they're always after one thing. And then if they get that one thing, then they'll do the bust out and try to get other things. But, um, you know, I will ask a few questions that seem like I'm trying to get them to say something. Well, could you just repeat that? Like, what is it exactly you need? I'm sorry. Could you say the whole thing? I don't, I don't just say the whole sentence mm -hmm. and then get mad at me and I'll be like, sir, this is Agent Smith from the FBI, and we yeah. um, just needed to keep you on the phone this long to have a fix on your location. We are sending local law enforcement to your place right now. Please don't move. <laughs> <laughs> they, they get to be uncomfortable for a day or two. Right. Yeah. Anytime you ever get a call from anyone who is either threatening or in some way it's just trying to get information out of you. you. know, one of the rules we always tell people is never authenticate yourself to any person who's contacting you for any reason who asks you to complete the picture. They have some yeah, information, right. but they want you to, to do the rest. Like in, in Bo's earlier example where uh, someone would say, uh, just, just to make sure you're you, what's your security code at the back of your credit or debit yeah. card? Yeah. And then they have one where they go further where they say, okay, it, it, it definitely appears that someone has tried to scam you, and we'd like to set in process a way for uh, uh, you to protect your data and your information, but to do that, for us to be effective with the credit reporting agency, we need your social security number. And mm. then, bingo, they got you every which way. From these situations, what are most people doing with these social security numbers? Oh, they are using that information, combining with other information they can get on the dark web, or using it combined with the other information that any particular consumer has been scammed into giving them. And they will do everything from take over existing accounts to opening new accounts in your name to depending upon the amount of information they have, mm -hmm. even going and getting medical treatment in someone's name, committing medical identity theft, or committing a crime and having the trail of breadcrumbs lead back to the victim. But other than that, yeah. almost nothing. Yes, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the social security number is really just the uh, skeleton key to your entire identity, unfortunately. Yeah. Now, but you have the right idea, Jordan. And, and I have to say, the only difference between you and someone who hasn't been scammed is very, very slight. You know what it is, Jordan? What is it? They haven't been scammed yet. Yep. The fact of the matter is, most of us could be scammed. Most of us don't have things set as securely as they need to be. And you mentioned sure. this whole list of things that you've done post-scam. And I'll tell you something. You are less vulnerable with your social security out there than a lot of people who don't know where their social security number is. Let me say that again because there is my, my mouth was full of spit. Than a lot of people who don't know where their social security number is and who has it. Yeah. You know, we tell people that you really need to assume that your information's out there and act accordingly, Yeah, which is to do all of the protective measures, whether it's long and strong passwords or a password manager, two-factor authentication so that it makes it more difficult and you will be notified if someone is trying to get into your accounts, to being more careful with links and attachments, to freezing your credit. Freezing your credit is a critically important thing, and recently I admitted that I had not frozen my credit all these years and, and <laughs> did so recently. And frankly, I'm feeling more secure. But you've done that. And you've done that at an early age. And I'm thankful for it because my business career has, you know, continued. My life's going to continue. I got to move forward. And that was just one situation. That was a small scale. You know, obviously, I'm a part of a lot more now. I'm, a, you know, I, I, I know multiple different accounts for different things. And at the end of the day, you know, I'm, I'm kind of grateful for it because it opened my eyes. I kind of, like you said, I've taken action. I, I, I freeze my credit cards. Um, I, I don't answer phone calls from random numbers. If I do, I hang up immediately. Um, and at the end of the day, I'm just kind of living by the whole aspect of if they're not knocking on my door, then it ain't real. And if they are knocking on your door, Jordan, it still might not be real. So be careful. Right. Okay. But the, uh, the yeah. other thing in, in Yiddish, we say rebegelt, which is money you pay the rabbi to learn. So the truth is that the $5,000 you paid, while a very large number when you were younger, 
is obviously very small compared to the numbers you're dealing in now. And you got, sure. you got one hell of an education. Sadly, you had to go through that, but you got the education and you've done the things you need to do to, to better protect yourself. For sure. And like I said, I mean, I feel like, you know, with these situations that have, that have arised, I'm kind of comfortable now with, you know, receiving a phone call like this. Um, I did receive many phone calls after the one that I did receive where this went down with the with the $5,000 in the headphone situation. And after that, I mean, obviously, I just didn't, you know, didn't give it a time of day, didn't respond to anything. But I did receive a lot of phone calls after that one because I guess, you know, that, you know, I'm, I'm giving what they want. So, yeah. Um, that's what took place, but that's kind of the story of, of, of what, you know, happened to me and uh, what can happen to others. And I'm glad I was able to share this experience with y'all. I think it's laudable that you uh, kind of got that an entrepreneurial uh, spirit when you were uh, 17 or 18. Bo has known me since I was 17 and can probably attest to the fact that I had no such ambition. <laughs> and I think it really, um, it, it's unfortunate just to see how scammers will pounce on absolutely anyone. Yeah. And what was crazy to me at my opening is, is that they go after the people that are very, very old and very, very young for the most part. Exactly. But like, you know, like y'all all said, you know, thankfully I have this experience with me continuing on the path of having a lot of accounts, having a lot of credit cards. You know, I'm glad that I have the experience and the knowledge that I have now with the accounts and the business that I'm moving forward. Hey, with your current trajectory, I wouldn't be surprised if all three of us would end up working for you someday. So uh, <laughs> keep at it. So we talk about scams a lot on this show, but we also, they can be, scams can take many shapes and, and forms, and they're not always, it's not always so clear that it's a scam. And I'm going to give you an example. We discovered that in our house, I live in this weird little wooden tent out in the woods, also known as a house. It's a house we're working on, lots of renovation. And we discovered we had mold. I had a guy come out. He didn't test, he didn't touch, he barely looked at anything, he said $20,000. I had another guy come in, tested everything and said, I don't do the remediation because people who do the remediation use my test, but I found that if I do the testing and the remediation, you can't really be sure that you got the job done right. Didn't give me a price, gave me a, a reference to a guy who does the work, he wanted $30,000. Another guy came in and said, all you need to do is, uh, this, this, and this, it's going to cost $11,000. How is it in that world that there's so many different uh, things going on? And can you, can you say that that kind of work has got a lot of scammers in it? Or is that not really scammers so much as salesmen? Um, I think a little bit of both. I think that you've got, obviously, a sales guy's a sales guy. Um, he's going to direct you and lead you in the way he wants it to be. And he's going to play the cards that he's going to deal. It's almost like when you go and you know you're getting ambushed. Yeah. The house wins and, and that can happen in sales. Um, but at the same time, I do feel within the restoration, within the construction industry, yeah, um, there definitely are some scams. There definitely are. Um, and I think that happens with a lot of SEO, a lot of Facebook ads, Google ads, um, and they reach out. They act as if they own a property. Um, they ask for a representative to come out and inspect it. They start moving forward and they don't own the house. Oh, wow. And how does that scam work then? I've never been fully a part of it. There's many ways that can go about. But yeah, I mean, I've had contractors in this industry. They've shown up to an appointment and it's mm -hmm. not a real person. They just wanted information from the business. I mean, there, there's just many ways to go about it where, where, where there's some, you know, sketchy, scammy stuff within construction. But I think more of it has to do with the person that you're working with. I really do. So there is, there are reputable remediation companies and it does exist and the prices can be all over the place just because they, they have different price structures and it, it doesn't necessarily mean because there's a $20,000 difference between two that one is better yes, than the other. for sure. For sure. Very reputable companies. Their pricing should be aligned within everything. Um, but then again, you're going to find, you know, a guy that's going to be a lot higher and a guy that's going to be a lot lower. A lot of times it can seem as if it's a scam, but really it isn't. And it's just that the prices are that, you know, far fetched, um, cause you have a sales guy selling you. If you think about it, a mold problem is a motivating factor, right? Cause you're told that can get you sick. That can be a problem. We got to get that solved. And that is, is similar to the kinds of things that scammers, like, you know, you found with the exploding AirPods. You know, it's always this thing of like, here's a situation that presents itself. 
it needs to get resolved quickly and now you are mine you know <laughs> and and i think that is where um i just that's what i hear when i heard your story today was like all the other situations legit and otherwise where adam i think you know what i'm going to say next where you got to go slow you do yes for sure i agree any area, any avenue, any business, any kind of field, I think that there's always going to be these situations within that particular industry, and you've just got to be alert. So, Jordan, what is the one piece of advice that you would give young people after what you went through when they get contacted by somebody that seems to know an awful lot about them? My advice is 100% stay away. I think that you don't answer the phone. I feel like you don't talk to these people. I feel like if, if you feel any bit bothered or uncertain, then then just stay away in today's society. I really do. And the same goes for dating people. If somebody knows yeah. a whole <laughs> bunch about you, your <laughs> rabbit is going to get boiled really soon. So be careful. I, be careful. I, I agree with you on that one. Jordan, we really appreciate it. and uh, And we can't thank you enough for taking the time to come on and and talk to us about this because what you live through is something that a lot of people face. A lot of people are forced to live through it. And the uh, faster that one can learn from it, the better. The danger is yeah, for sure. when people don't learn from it is the old phrase, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I'm with you. Thanks an awful lot for taking the time. I really enjoyed listening to Jordan, and there was, you may have noticed there was this point, but I'm pretty sure I do know how he got hacked, and I'm pretty sure it was his pick, pack, and ship place. Yeah, that seems likely. Who else is going to know? I think it was an inside job. It has to be. It, it, would, it seems logical, because obviously they knew about his bank account. They knew about yeah. the business he did. They knew about the people with whom he was doing business. So it sure sounds like somebody that was involved in the process went after him on it. Yeah, and I think that that is the nature of compromise. We don't think of compromise meaning an inside job, but it often is. Like, you know, I told that story about Winona Ryder uh, and the guy at the phone company. I mean, uh, it, 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 you never know who's going to get you, but it can come through services. No, that's why the, the, a huge category that they talk about with scams and everything is insider threat. And this is an example of an insider threat that proved to be a reality. The whole thing about the drop shipping industry in general, too, is that they are opaque by design. The entire industry, the entire business model is based around not really knowing who it is that's shipping the stuff. Um, and you're dealing only through proxies online like Jordan. Well, in one sense, it's almost like Russian roulette. You never know who, where the bullet's coming from. You never know where, which service you're doing business with or what vendor you're doing business with where someone could know enough about you to create a problem for you. Like Jordan, whose social security number is out there, although after Equifax, all of our social security numbers are out there. Right, and the point is that you need to act as though you're always being targeted, because you are. You have to assume that you're in somebody's crosshairs, that you're always going to be targeted, because you are. And when it comes to your data, there's no such thing as a innocent question. <laughs> true. No, there's no innocent questions, it's true. Okay, so it's time for the tinfoil swan, guys. Our paranoid takeaway to help keep you safe online. And what's on your mind this week, Adam? You're implying that I have a mind? Yeah. I know in the past we've talked about personal privacy audits. This week, I want to talk about the importance of knowing what's knowable about you online. Knowing what's knowable about you online. All right, fine. Let's parse this a little bit. What is a, let's start with the privacy audit. Travis, go ahead. Sure. Off the top of my head, I'd just say a personal privacy audit is more about what you've shared online, especially through social media. Okay. Well, also what you're in the habit of sharing, right. because that'll just keep getting worse. All right. And what's knowable about you online is probably a more expensive category. Exactly. We're going to be talking about information that's been collected about you by third parties. It's data that can be researched. OSINT. You know what that is? Open source intelligence, which is another way of saying, <laughs> I mean, Google. Uh, there's several services that can make information about you publicly available, often for a small fee, but a lot of it is free. The first step though, is you gotta start looking at what is out there by using a search engine. And let us not forget the dark web. 
Yeah, that's true. You can buy massive archives compiled from data breaches with really granular data, including your social security number. So the first question is, how do you see what's available about you online? And it's easy. Like I was saying, Google, not just your name, your address and other, you know, quote unquote, sensitive pieces of information. Adam, name some sensitive, quote unquote, sensitive pieces of information. Ah, your cell phone number, your email address. And while you're at it, check other search engines. I came across a website on DuckDuckGo, which is ironically a privacy-centric search engine, and I found a data broker site that listed my name, current address, previous addresses, birthday, information about my wife, relatives, friends, all for free. And that result was not on Google. Well, that's right. And so you do have to check all the search engines. And when I say Google yourself, I don't mean Google your name. You need to check other basic information. And you're gonna, you are gonna have to take an hour or so because you gotta use Bing, you gotta look at DuckDuckGo, you gotta look at the different search engines as Travis was saying. You can ask to have your information removed. Of course, you could pay a service to do it for you. Yeah. But if you go that route, you don't have to give them much more than your name, address, and previous addresses. In other words, enough information to authenticate a bank account? You gotta look at it as tiles in a mosaic. The more tiles, the clearer the mosaic. The clearer the mosaic, the better that you can be impersonated. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Keep in mind that if you get your data removed from one of these data broker sites, there's no guarantee that it's not going to pop up again. Right. So that site where I found my data this week was one that I'd actually requested a removal for earlier. And uh, paid mm -hmm. services can keep on top of that for you. Oh, paid services. Right. What about dark web monitoring, Adam? I use it, but it doesn't stop the data leak. Right. Once your data is out there, you can't really put the genie back in the bottle. But it does let you know to be on your guard. But if you are going to use one of these services, you got to check the reviews to make sure they're legit. And that is our tinfoil swan. <laughs>